There we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Social Selling for Newbies. Uh, for those on the live, we're sorry, we're a couple minutes late, left in like some restream LinkedIn technical difficulties to kick off a Wednesday afternoon. And everybody on the podcast, thank you for joining us. We don't mean to uh, leave you out as we always talk to the live audience, but, uh, you know, they're live right here in front of us. And so uh, welcome to Social Selling for Newbies, Carson, Hetty, and I, and Tom Burton joining in here at the last minute. Had to make welcome, Tom. You know. We can't hear you, though. Your mic is low volume. So everybody... Yeah, thank you. We just wanted a couple uh, housekeeping things while, while Tom's getting situated anyway is just a reminder of modernsellerhq.com, which is our free community uh, for anybody that wants to join there. There's lots of conversations going on, asking questions, sharing answers. Um, we'd love to have you over there as well. And if you ever, you know, if you're on the podcast, you're listening, you want to join us live on the show, we go Wednesdays at 3.30 Eastern time uh, on our LinkedIn page. And Sherelle, thank, oh, thank you, you so much for joining us. Gosh, I haven't talked to Sherelle in so long. Good to see you on here. And she's saying hi to all of us, Brandon, welcome. Well, Carson and Tom, we have a fun topic, I think. Can, can you today. hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can, we you can hear you, crisp. Verizon man. I'm, you sound okay. crisp. All right, good. There you good. go. Don't touch anything. So, uh, should we kick off with my uh, my bad dad joke for the day? Do Must we have we? to? Hey, I've we already got the movie uh, reference ready to go too. So we're we're Excellent. really firing on all cylinders. We, we must are have all set. Day off. It was that uh, that Monday reprieve. That'll do, that'll do it for sure. Well, this right, one, uh, this this jab joke is actually out for all the for all the Gen Xers out there. So, Tom, not you. Uh, Just kidding. That was brutal. Yeah. Okay. Tough crowd. Kobe, Tough crowd. must we? Poor Kobe doesn't <laughs> want to hear it, but I'm gonna say it anyways. So, uh, the other day, I walked past the lead singer of REM, and I thought I heard him laughing. Oh boy. Dope. No. No. Yeah, right. Kobe is that was that really really We're bad. I need to give you a stipend to buy new jokes. Yeah. Oh. You can, know. Can you one? Do you have a backup for that? ChatGPT no, didn't like that. I actually came up with that one myself. <laughs> that's it. That's it. No, if that one was that bad, I'm not even going to the backup. It'd be horrible. Well, let's jump in then. Let's talk about social selling and today's topic. And Tom, I know you you and I talked about this too. And, and it's, uh, does social selling really work? And um, Carson, I know you have great answers for it as well. So what I'd love to do is invite everybody on, the, on LinkedIn or wherever you are, if you're uh, listening live and chatting. Um, if you have any thoughts, comments, questions, throw them in, in the chat and we'll get them, we'll get you involved and answer your questions or respond to what you have to say and we'll go from there. But um, as we get this started, uh, Carson, we had talked about uh, getting questions a lot of times, like from cynical of, oh yeah, does it really work to, well, does this social selling stuff really work? Um, how, how do you kick that off? What's, what's your response when someone asks you that question? Yeah, well, I got a few thoughts. So first off, uh, a couple of questions I want to address that are in the chat. Yes, we are really live. Um, Colby, you said you didn't get it. So the lead singer of REM is Michael Stipe. So that's why I said I was going to get a stipend so that Brandon could buy some new jokes so he could entertain uh, you. You guys deserve better jokes from us. So uh, that is that is very true. We're going to get Brandon yeah. some budget. Um, but when I, when people ask me now if social selling really works, as opposed to <laughs> if they asked me 10 years ago, my answer would be very, very different. And um, I'm going to lead off with my musical reference. It's uh, from my favorite sales movie, uh, The Color of Money. It's in the way that you use it. And uh, Eric Clapton song right back from the. Uh, very good. Right after Top Gun, Tom Cruise did Color of Money. So check it out if you haven't seen it. I wrote an article recently on why it's the greatest sales movie of all time. Um, however, 
Does social selling work? Uh, I've closed 16 deals for $300 million that would never have existed if I didn't make the first connection on LinkedIn. So that is my answer now. Now, 10 years ago, I started using it and it's all about what, what, is, what is work? How do you define does it work, right? So what, what's, your, what's your objective? And we've talked a lot on this show about what that objective really is, right? I mean, the objective is to get more at bats. The objective is to get more customer discussions, conversations. The objective is to stay better informed about what's top of mind for our customers, you know, what they're sharing when there's M&A activity, when there's a new executive leadership uh, change, um, you know, when there's a restructuring, being able to see all those types of things. And frankly, also to be able to forge a, a strong new connection with a top prospect. Um, I'm continuing to track my own journey here and I'm going to continue to keep you guys all updated. Um, I recently just shared book uh, topics. I've not gotten the meeting with this, my top of the top. So like my kind of Moby Dick of prospects right now. Um, I, I don't want to go in and, and scare them off with something when I'm not completely ready with what you know the message that I want to land is. Uh, but we shared book uh, recommendations just this week on LinkedIn via one of his posts. And so uh, we're, we're getting really close. But when you ask me if social selling really works, yes, it works. Uh, it's all in how you use it and what you're using it for. Um, and I've got the results to back it up. We've got statistics that back it up that we talk about here. And be very intentional about what you're trying to use it for when you define how it works for you, because it's going to work for everybody different. Tom, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so... You know, it's funny about the question, what does social selling work? When people ask me that nowadays, my question back to them is, well, is your current selling model working, right? Whether that's a traditional model or, a, you know, the, a, a more relationship, hey, I go visit people in person or I have BDRs or SDRs or outbound or inbound. And, you know, I ask, is that working? And when you start to peel the onion, I would say in 99% of the case, the answer is no it's not working or it's not working in a way that there it's, it's a profitable, predictable way of driving sales, right? It's like, maybe you can spend $10 to get a dollar's worth of revenue, but that's not a real viable model, especially now in this day and age. So, um, so the question I ask, is it working in there? And the answer is generally no, when it comes out of there. So then I look and say, okay, so are you looking to do things you know, that are going to work or be more effective. And then I point people back to the, our two episodes about social selling by the numbers, right? When you look at some of those numbers that we went through, I, I know there's two episodes. One, I think was episode four, and then one maybe 18 or 19 just, just recently, which was, you know, what are the statistics associated with using a social selling strategy and technique? And I know we're going to talk more a bit about what we mean by that social selling strategy and technique here, but the, the numbers just is like, are un, you know, are un, you just can't refute the numbers, right? The numbers mm -hmm. tell the story and they're so different compared to more traditional. So my answer would be is, you know, what does your current model work? And then go take a look at this and then compare those and then answer that question for yourself, right? From based There's on- there's a mic drop comment in the chat that Sherelle shared. And, and look, you know, here's the thing. So she says, if you commit to social selling, then it works. If you don't commit, then it doesn't. Consistency with social selling is key. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, here's the thing, Tom, you just said something super brilliant that I think we need to zero in on for a second. What do we hear from our organizations that we work in all day, every day, if you're in sales? What do they need more of? They need more pipeline more revenue. Yep. And so that's where, you know, we have to look to how can we best meet that? Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I've, I will never discriminate against any possible way to create new conversations and relationships with customers and social can exponentially amplify it. If you commit to it, like Sherelle said, can exponentially amplify the total number of people that you're working with and talking to and that you're building your community around if you leverage it in that way. Well, and I want to, yeah. Brandon, this comes back to our second favorite question that we hear a lot, right, is, well, how much time is this going to take? And mm -hmm. I always, again, my question goes back, well, what are you doing with your other time, right? 
Like, is, th yeah. is there some other special thing that you've got going that is going to be more, you know, results oriented than what we're doing here? And so, again, it comes back to the mindset that we've talked about on different and, and the commitment and the consistency that Sherelle is bringing up here. This is not something that you're just doing is like a little gimmick or a little, you know, well, I tried this and now I'm going to go back to sort of the old way. It's like this is the way. And I think that if, once you've committed to that, everything is different. And here's the thing. It works, period. Right. right? right. So unless you're 100 percent satisfied with your current sales results, what are you risking by looking at a different way of doing things and a different way of engaging people? There's ways that you can so use social from a very focused perspective, you know, running very specific targeted plays. And there's also ways that you can do things at scale. Now, the time commitment question, and Brandon, I want to hear your thoughts here too, because this is an important one. It's one of the biggest areas of pushback that we get around social is I, I just don't have the time for this. Well, what, what's your better performance worth? Is it worth spending some time? Because yes, I have spent hours exporting manually, marketing uh, touches that, you know, customers have done within a customer organization. I've gone in and, and built a list, you know, around people that have opted into being marketed to. I have thousands of leads that I've exported in this way. It was a manual process and it was a little painful. I did it at the beginning of the year. It was a little arduous, but guess what? I used that thing multiple times per month to build campaigns with my team. It was well worth the time. I would never undo that. And we're going to do things sometimes that are a waste of time. We learn from that, right? Maybe we do it differently mm -hmm. the next time or we do it smarter the next time. But uh, I don't regret a single second that I've ever spent on social selling. And I think that's key to understand. So if you're 100% satisfied with your sales results today and the number of conversations and pipeline you're having, maybe this isn't for you. But if you'd like to have more pipeline and deals and success, check it out. And I think I, I like what uh, David said here. And, and I think this is so spot on is, What's generally not working is their sales process, not the channel or channels that they're using. And David, I think that that is, that is so important to understand because, you know, one of the things that I, I say is if, a, um, if, if you have a salesperson and they're, they're making calls and they're not hitting their numbers, do you jump to the conclusion that calling doesn't work? No, you generally make the conclusion of like, do we have the right numbers? Are we contacting the right people? Do they have a good script? What are they saying? Have we recorded their calls for training purposes? Like there's a slew of questions that companies would ask, but for some reason with social, we've talked about that whole mindset thing. We're supposed to think that if we just post a few things on LinkedIn, that POs are going to magically fall in our inbox. I think one of the, you know, I get, I get asked a lot, does it really work? And then the follow-up question, of course, Tom, is how much time does it take? But the other one is, well, what exactly do I do? And there's a lot of answers to what exactly do I do. But one of the ways that I have found social to be the most effective for me and therefore the people that I coach and train in it is to move ourselves from being this cold and unknown person to being a warm, familiar person before we try to reach out to them in any capacity. So before you drop an email, before you make a call, before any sort of outreach, and, and it is a little bit of this, go a little bit slower to move quicker. It's not like day one, okay, let's just go send out connection requests to you know 8,000 people or something. It's go engage with the content that they're engaging with. Now, notice I didn't say go engage with their post because immediately most people say, oh, my, my prospects, my, my contacts, wherever they don't post. I get that. Like the numbers are clear about 1% of LinkedIn users publish content on a regular basis. And that 1% accounts for over 9 billion engagements a week. So if you're not publishing, you're missing out. But what does that mean is that your contacts, as long as they're active in LinkedIn, they're logging in a couple times a week, they're liking posts, they're commenting on posts. If you go to their post activity feed and you comment on a post that they've already liked or commented on, LinkedIn's going to send them a notification with your name and your picture and go, boom, 
Tom Burton commented on a post that you liked. And there's, there's their information. And you do this three or four times before you send a connection request. You're able to use your activity to move yourself from being completely cold and unknown, which is really going to get the, the Heisman, right? To being a, oh, I recognize this person. I've seen them. They're in my network. And, you know, my clients have all different um, data points on it, but 80%, 200% more connection requests, some, some higher. Well, and that's the first step, right, of the process of, of social selling, right, is the first step of getting that point where you've built a healthy connection, as we call it. Yep. But that's not the For end sure. of the process, right? That's not the end all be all. That's just the first step of the of the social selling journey, if you will, along the way. Yeah. But it certainly gets you out on that right foot. And generally when people are asking, especially those that are skeptical, I like to start with that because it's a better way of getting connection requests accepted. And you can just kind of pause there and say, go try that for a little bit. See how that works for you before you move on to the you know deeper things. It's like we don't we don't throw a, a new sales rep right in the boardroom doing PowerPoint presentations. You know, we, they got to cut their teeth a little bit on cold calls and other things. But yeah, you're totally right, Tom. That's that's step one. And then step two would be using social to continue to engage, sharing information, commenting deeper, things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and we've and, and I think, you know, we, we kind of outlined a series of steps or phases, if you will. And, and we're going to do we're going to do more of this as we go further, because I think one of the biggest feedback we've heard from people on this podcast and in the community, Brandon, you mentioned earlier is help me with more specifics, right? How do I mm -hmm. actually do this? I mean, the theory is great and the concept is great, but how do I actually apply and do this day in and day out? And so that's an area we're spending a lot of time on, right? Trying to sort out and get figured yeah. out all of that. But from a phase perspective, we sort of have what you just said is the start off is build that relationship, that online digital relationship, maybe relationships, too strong a word, maybe awareness, right? That digital awareness. Mm -hmm. And it's funny you mentioned that because it's like, you know, I don't know if you have an Apple watch or whatever, but I get little things on my Apple watch all day about Carson commented on Brandon's posts and all your picture pops up and all of that stuff. I mean, it's like you couldn't pay for that kind of exposure, you know, that you're that, getting... can, can I pause? Can I pause you there for a second? Because that's huge. If you think about it, I mean, whether it's an Apple watch or something, but it's true. Whenever I I get those pings and I and I did, I got one from Carson today and I looked down and there's Carson's picture right on my watch looking at me. And then I have to scroll up and I could see that, you know, yeah. Carson I don't know. I think we both commented on somebody's post or something, but I did see Carson's picture. And when we're not connected to somebody and we want to be connected to them and we want to be able to establish some sort of an initial conversation and connection, if they see us on their watch three or four times and then we send a connection request, I mean, that's, that's money. It's brand familiarity. I mean, that's yeah. what it is. And that's what we're trying to yeah. create with our target customers. You know, I think Tom, to your point, <clears throat> a lot of the times, we'll get questions about like, where do I start? And, you know, frankly, I, you know, I'm very fortunate because I get the chance to train sellers globally at a large company around social selling. And I always preface it by saying, look, what I've built over the last nine years here, um, it's going to look a little intimidating at first. You know, it took a lot of steps and a lot of learnings and a lot of pivots um, to get here. But at the heart of it is, you know, intentionality. And, you want to really map out, okay, whatever your scenario is, you, you know and own your playing field. Um, so like what are going to be the key relationships that you need? Is it a specific title that you're after? Is it a specific organization? Is it a specific industry? And then from that, you know, there's multiple layers. Okay, how am I going to arm myself with information and point of view and perspective? So I go out and I subscribe to all the trade magazines and the business journals and the you know, I use my sales navigator, I follow people, I follow the organization so that I've kind of customized my feed. Um, I may do the same with, you know, wherever my audience is, if they're on Twitter or they're on Instagram, you know, kind of cultivating your feed to be built for arming you with intel and actionable insights. 
And what I mean by that is like, you know, Business Journal or Sales Navigator may say, oh, hey, this new executive joined this organization that I support or they're a target prospect. Great. I need to act. I need to act immediately. And I reach out and it's, you know, then the other element of that, it's relationship driven, but it's also resource focused. Um, I always think about relationships and resources, people and process. The people that I want to engage, that's one thing. But what are the resources that I'm going to use? And you've got to be fully cognizant that it isn't going to be necessarily that first connection request or that first message that's going to elicit the response, right? Uh, I've had many customers where, I mean, it's taken two to three years before I've been able to entice them to maybe a webinar or get them to respond to a newsletter. You build a system, you build a process, you build a machine around what you're endeavoring to do, but it's all with the, as my friend Bill Kirst likes to say, it's all with the bid to connect and connect with meaningful insight uh, and perspective, unique perspective, stories, how what you've done for other organizations in of similar like or in similar use cases is going to resonate with these folks. And it's got to be it's got to be outside of the average. It's got to be outside of all the other sales pitches and pitch slaps that they hear all the time. And that's why the important piece is the relationship of it. You got to realize that everybody that's out there running and gunning like you is sending a lot of mass email that sounds generic, that means nothing, or they're sending connection requests without a personalized comment, or they're not commenting on posts. They're not doing the stuff Brandon talked about, and you're they're sure as heck not showing up on their smartwatches, right? So how can you get to the smartwatch how can you show up three to five, maybe 10 times a month in their feed different ways so that you become a known entity? Because guess what? When you're a known entity and you build a relationship, you have de-risked the situation for your target prospect. And that's why they're going to take your meeting. Now, if I send out 100 connection requests or if I send out 100 meeting requests even, I'm going to get some traction. And that's the key. And that's why it's worth the time. But you also want to do things along the way that are going to improve up, improve that batting average. So if I get, you know, if I send 100 connection requests and I used to get 20 that accepted, what messaging could I use to move that to 50? And that's what time gives you. Uh, because over nine years, I've improved my batting average from about 30% connection request rate to over 50% and so on and so forth. Hall of Fame. Hall Carson's of Fame. Carson's on fire today. I'm yeah. fired up. I don't know what it is. That's an extra day. I think it's a good day. And I took the day immersing in the presidents and I always reread uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Man in the Arena. And um, I've also been really diving in lately to um, Tim Grover's book, Winning, uh, which is, you know, he's the guy who trained Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, D Wade, et cetera. So I'm just like, I'm really fired up. So you guys have like, you are prime time Carson today. Salesman on fire, baby. Salesman. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted to touch on something though, just a story that, kind of resonates with the way you were just saying, Carson. So I had, a, we had a customer and they had a really, really good pro, a really good product, innovative product that has a lot of value and they just couldn't get any traction, right? They were just not getting traction. They weren't getting traction. And the reason they weren't getting traction was, is because nobody was listening to the value that they were able to provide, right? They were able to provide a ton of value with their product, but no, they couldn't get enough attention from people to get them to, they would even listen to the fact that they would have some value, right? And I think that's what a lot of, there's a couple comments in here, you know, even about spam and things like that. With all the noise out there, most people, all of us kind of turn it off and there could be some great stuff, but if I'm just noised, I'm never going to pay attention to the noise. And Honestly, Tom, that's how you stand out amidst the noise. Do the right, things exactly. others aren't doing exactly. or won't do. You know, you asked right. me about the time commitment. You know that why I'm willing to spend three hours exporting a thousand contacts manually for one customer? Because I know what that's going to do when I do 12 newsletters in a year or I do 20 webinars in a year and I'm able to attract 100 people from that organization every single session I do. You can't buy that kind of pipeline build right. but, they're giving, and, but they're giving you, know, you the opportunity to provide value yeah and sending video like yeah. how many sellers out there are sending video in linkedin messages to people and you know video introductions and you know you can build these in a way like you use smart links out of sales navigator you can put your content in there you can put your video introduction in there you can get telemetry out of that so i can see who views it they may not respond but I can tell who views these things repeatedly over time. And that's actionable insight. 
And it's all about propensity. It's about propensity to take my call, take the meeting, uh, move forward in the process. And that's why, you know, then you start to gravitate toward these high probability to succeed activities. Yep. Man, on. Carson, you are on fire today. Thank you. Preach it, brother. Keep going. Right. I, 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 and this is a passionate item because, you know, I was tooting the social selling uh, horn long, long ago when everybody thought it was this anomaly. And um, I'm just, I'm like, I feel like we're, we're celebrating this renaissance of social selling. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I'm going to reiterate what you said there, too, for everybody is, you know, they go, well, what am I supposed to do within social selling? Well, look, it's you, you post content, you comment on other people's content, you be intentional, you get the mindset of being there to serve, because if you're there to sell, like if you if you smell like a sales rep, <laughs> buyers very easily just shut you out because you're not face to face with them. You're on a screen. It's easy for them. I mean, we, we've talked about this before. Is it's so easy for people to go salespeople these days. And I think there was a there was a Gartner study that asked people, is it is it morally okay to lie to salespeople? And it was like 70% said yes. Like it's just plain okay. If you're a salesperson, it's okay. But what we've learned over the years too is when you're you're using social to engage with them to, as Carson says, you know, to build your brand in front of them, to build brand recognition. They recognize you. You show up on their Apple watch. Then when you start engaging with them and talking with them, they're more likely to stay involved because they now know you, not just, um, you know, I, they see your name in your picture when you're sending out a connection request, but they've seen you around. They feel more connected and generally, when people feel connected, they're going to give you more time. And if you keep serving and serving, then they're going to keep looking at you. They're not going to start smelling for sales rep anymore. They're immediately going to perceive you as that trusted advisor and then come to you and say, all right, we need help. What do we do? There's another key component of social selling that I think it's important that we talk about here. And there's some great comments here. So like David, what's generally not working is their sales process, not the channels they're using. We talked about that. Love that. Brandon, social is a tool, how you use it, how often you use it greatly affects your results. Don't ever do anything or go down a path where you can't have tangible, trackable results. You know, have some kind of mechanism in place where you're tracking your, your inputs and the outputs, the outcomes of, you know, what you're doing. You know, if I send out 100 connection requests, I mean, I, I want to know, like, what, what's, the, what's the return on that? Who's, who's reacting and responding? Can I raise that? Um, I've always taken a very counterintuitive approach to my messaging. Um, as a salesperson, I mean, I've been rejected every which way but loose, right? So I understand if I'm hearing a certain rejection or a certain way that I'm being responded to or shut down, I try to build a counterintuitive approach into that. And so I've, that's how I've increased my batting average is by saying, you know, hey, I acknowledge that, you know, your, your company is investing substantially in our, our organization or you're doing projects together. Or I acknowledge that um, perhaps we had a, uh, um, an unfavorable trajectory or project in the past or, or whatever it is, right? You're coming from that vantage point of I'm, I'm overcoming the objection before you even throw it at me. Um, but I understand that we're coming from this place. I have a unique opportunity here, or perhaps I'd like to dive into your existing investment and make sure you have more value out of it. Um, or these are problems that we're solving right now in your industry. I'd love to get your take or your, uh, your feedback. Those are the types of things that really resonate. The last thing I want to say Shannon, your comment, gold, buyers are humans. We should engage with them as humans who have a real interest in the problem they're trying to solve. Wow. That's real. That's authentic. That is what's going to be your golden ticket to the show is if you show up seeking to serve, seeking to add value, and you just invest in creating a relationship. Those are the biggest deals that I've ever closed started with zero expectation. And it was exactly what you just said. I wasn't thinking about the number, the deal, the quota, the business, getting the signature. It was, how do I get this conversation? How do I invest in this relationship? And it's amazing what can happen when you do that. And, and what I like about that, it, it, just to pause for everybody to hear what Carson and Shannon were saying, but not hear what they weren't saying, which is, if we go into it going, how can I get a meeting? How can I get the demo? 
How can I move them into an opportunity? And I know people have all this pressure from sales leadership, right? Is it an opportunity? Is it an opportunity? But it's so counterintuitive. The harder we push to try and get them there, the more they're going to resist. So it is go, go slow. If you go in with that mindset, how do I serve them? How do I ask questions? What can I share with them that would add value to them? And I know in some ways these can be really trite terms like, oh yeah, go add value. But if you really have that mindset in going into these conversations or even sending them messages or posting your content, it, that's what builds up that big pipeline. As Carson said earlier, what is it that all sales leaders and companies want? More pipeline, more revenue. Pushing them makes them run. Nurturing them makes them come in. Yeah, no, really well said. And I, I really did like um, Shannon's comment that you went through there, Carson, because if you just looked at it, if you just took that one point, right, and you applied that and said, okay, I'm going to go in and looking at how do I help that person or how do I look at that from that perspective, everything else starts to fall into place around that central point, right? It becomes sort of the, the heart of the mindset, if you will, that we've talked about a lot. And this isn't some wishy-washy sort of, you know, Didi weedy type of thing. This is really, this is what works, right? It's yeah. what works. And Brandon, you hit the nail on the head. The harder you push and the more pressure, the more that the people are going to resist and turn you off and you end up being a toxic connect connection and your noise, right? At that point, no matter how great a value you actually may be able to provide, it doesn't, they're not judging you on that. They're judging you on how big of an asshole you were on your, and how pushy you were. Mm -hmm. See, I still go back to when I started social selling, wow, now 10 years ago, and the gentleman who showed me the value of what they thought social selling could be about, so I don't even think it really ever eclipsed their, their dreams for them, right? I mean, this was years ago, but it was, he told me, he's like, find ways to stay top of mind. And Tom, what you just said is so important because, you know, hey, I can show up in people's feed multiple times a day. Um, I can show up on their smartwatch. I can show up on their phone, whatever it is. But the key element is there's a, a passive element where I'm seeking permission to be brought into that fold. And the more I show up, the more I engage with what they care about, the more I engage with what they're posting and they're saying, the, the likelihood of me getting the meeting and then that turning into a burgeoning relationship goes way up and that's what makes social selling work yep. yeah that's really good I, I don't think we we emphasize enough for people to that top of mind right and this isn't even just social media it's just social media makes it easier and faster but when someone recognizes you and they see you and they see you again and they recognize you and you're in comments and you're posting and you know they're much more likely to get on the phone with you I mean, it's very simple psychology of it, right? Well, Brandon, I mean, I you're getting what three, four, five inbound requests every week from people like that that just followed your dad jokes and reach out to you. And <laughs> that was probably not the reason, but just imagine how many it would be if they were really good. No, know? I know, I know. Imagine if, if I had. It. Imagine if I had skill. Right, but you I know mean, what's you're, amazing you're, if you think about it, like. Um, you know, it, it's, it's wild to think because, you know, the, the top of my stuff, like thinking about problems that all salespeople have, has anybody ever had a deal get stuck? And we were just talking about like customers ghosting salespeople. I can't tell you how many times I've sent a newsletter or done a webinar or sent a message on social or whatever it was where a customer owed me a response on something that was deal related the message I sent them or the newsletter was not deal related. And then they responded and they're like, Oh, I know I owe you a response. Here you go. The value of staying top of mind mm -hmm. reminds that customer that, Hey, maybe the first time my email landed in their inbox, they weren't quite in the place to respond to me, but you see your, yourself a couple more times. It enhances the probability that they're going to get back to you as well. Yeah. And following up with a piece of content is so much better than the, I'm just following up. Like that is the kiss of death, in my opinion. Man, just just stay away from the I'm just following up. Like it's awful.
Nobody Seriously. wants to respond to that. I did a show one time with Liz Wendling, who's great. And she's very candid and blunt about it. It's like, you know, she calls it like the sales love language. And it's like, you got to get away from thinking about like what we love to do, or I'm, I'd love to touch base or I'm following up. <laughs> Customer doesn't care. Customer doesn't care what you love. They, you know, they care about what they love. So we got to figure out what it is that they love and meet them there. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, there's such an art and finesse to sales and it is, it's a process. There's so many inputs that we can make. And that's why social selling is so important because we can learn about our prospect. You find out their style, what they're talking about, what they care about. So you can show up from a more informed position. Um, you know, you, you line up a, a social seller, a great social seller with a lot of other folks that are super technically smart, but don't necessarily, you know, sound like everybody else. Who do you think is going to get the best batting average? I mean, it's it's literally why a guy like me with an advertising and telecommunications background can be successful in a telecommunications company. I have zero business being successful here, but I have been because of social selling. And the last thing I would add on that thread is, you know, when you ask, does social selling really work? I go back to what we talked about at the beginning of that work for what? Because not only can it enhance your sales results, but it can also enhance your personal brand. Over time, I've become known as the social seller, mm -hmm. the top social seller of Microsoft. And it was there was a formal part of it carved into my role. I've become uh, you know, a known entity because of it. And I've met people all over the world as a result of it. So it works not only in improving your day-to-day -day results, but it can improve your personal brand, what you're known for, how you show up for your team. Um, you know, I started sharing best practices with my team, learning from them what was working, what wasn't working for them. And I get better because of conversations like this that I'm having. I can't tell you how many tools I use because I heard about them from Brandon or Tom or somebody else on the social selling train. That's the beauty of it all. Yeah. Let's transition real quick, guys. I think one of the questions we are kind of more of a statement, I think we hear is people that say, uh, well, I've been posting for two months and nothing's happening. What's what do you guys do or what do you recommend for people around actually publishing content? We've talked a lot about commenting. We've talked about doing research, getting your intel. But really, if you're not, you, you've got to break out of that that shell of I'm scared to post. Right. It's like you can't go in a networking room and not talk to people. Um, no matter how hard it is, take a course, do whatever, you have to start publishing content as well. If you don't, you're just not opening your mouth. So guys, what do you, what have you learned and what works well for you when it comes to publishing content in terms of actually having it help you uh, start more conversations and build more relationships? Yeah, I'll answer first. And then, you know, Carson, I think you're you've really done a great job of this and might have a little bit of a different thing, but <clears throat> I think publishing when, and, and I think it's very important to differentiate that publishing content and commenting are very different, right? Very different strategies, very different things. So we're talking about when you're publishing or posting something out there, I think it's super important to have a strong point of view that, it's a point of view that adds value and that can, again, cut through the noise. I don't know about you, but if I look at my LinkedIn feed right now and I, I follow a lot of marketers and salespeople, I'll see really good posts, but they're very vanilla. They're all the same, right? They're all saying the same thing with maybe different words. It's not they've maybe taken somebody else's point of view and restructured it a little bit. It's like, OK, well, that's probably not going to get the engagement or the or the or the punch that you're looking for. So I think there's a real art, and I think this is this is going to get become more and more the case as more and more people start to publish, is how do you have a strong point of view and and then have be able to back up that point of view with a really good high quality um, value, whether you're providing information or education or whatever the case may be, that and it's okay if at that point of view isn't agreed with everybody. Like be a bit controversial, be Go out of the box, you know, look, use your experience that's unique and create that point of view. I think that's a, a skill that's going to get, you know, more and more necessary. And um, it's an area I've been researching and it's an area that I, I certainly don't feel like I have it nailed, but I can see that that is really something that's going to be the secret to 
successful posting, if you will? I think it comes down to, uh, you know, the intentionality component. I challenge a lot of people that say, oh, I've been posting a lot of stuff. What are you posting? What are you posting about? I find a lot of people like even in my own organization, they'll make posts about how great our organization is or an article about uh, a new product launch or whatever. 99% 99% of your audience doesn't care. And most of your likes are going to be from our company. So what's the value of that from a social perspective? You can't post something and just magically expect somebody's going to call and be like, oh my gosh, I have to talk to you immediately about this article that came out about your company today. That's not going to happen. But what can happen is some of the things that we've talked about throughout our episodes, um, I'll boil it down in a, in a couple of moments here. It all comes down to controlling the controllable elements, right? Um, There's different ways of posting. You know, I've tinkered with a lot of them over the years doing video, uh, you know, video content where you do like a two, four, six, you know, sub 10 minute video and you post it direct to LinkedIn. LinkedIn algorithm likes that, right? That gives you a capability to go out and talk about whatever you want to talk about. Maybe you're talking about your company. Maybe you're talking about your product, right? Um, The other thing too, that you can control is like when you go on your LinkedIn feed or your page, Do you have it set up in a way that that's going to be a good landing spot? So somebody who's intrigued is going to go to your page and say, hey, you know, this this person could be the person I want to talk to. See, that's the other thing. You've got to go from being a person that can talk about whatever you're wanting to talk about to the person. The influencer, the trusted advisor, that's what you're going to do. And I think that's bringing that point of view allows you to elevate, right? Because you have something unique to talk about. Yeah, you can put hashtags, right? You can put hashtags in your profile. You can tag content, featured content on your profile so that your landing page looks great. The content you post, tinker with video, tinker with blogs, tinker with, you know, short form uh, posts, ask questions, use polls, try it all because you never know what your audience is going to mostly gravitate toward. And that's been my approach. I'm just trying to, you know, seeking to find, you know, connections and relationships and, you know, I'll post provocative things about sales and culture one day. And then the next day I might post about something really cool that my, my company did with a very specific customer tagging that customer organization. And those things go over like gangbusters. Um, It took me a long time to learn some of these things. So that's why you want to try it all. Yeah, that's really good. I I think that, um, we, Carson, you say this really well and you say it a lot is you gotta, first of all, sales isn't easy and you have to do the actions that it takes. You spent three hours manually dealing with the database. Why? Because there was value in it for you over a longer period of time. So yeah, that three hours may have sucked, but you invested the time because it was valuable for you to do. I think having courage is one of the biggest challenges that people have when it comes to posting content. Um, We talked about this a few weeks ago. My own recent journey is um, I've been reading, I have been reading more and more about the engagement value of selfies, right? And and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't like doing those. I just, all these, you know, horrible images come up, but I keep seeing more and more. It's like, this has high engagement rates. Well, what is my goal? My goal is to meet more people. My goal is to serve more people. If that's going to help me meet more people, serve more people, get exposed and in front of more people and build my brand, then get out of your comfort zone and try it. So I think for everyone listening, look, creating posts, and, and I love Tom, what you said is vanilla posts are just that. They're just vanilla, they're fine. You know, I, I enjoy vanilla ice cream, but if I'm going to spend my money at, you know, on, on whatever, we have Brewster's here locally or Jenny's ice cream, man, I'm going to get something that's good. And I think with post, if, if you want people to really engage and want them to remember you, you've got to have some courage in it. I think more video, more pictures, more strong stances on things. And, and even, even if you don't do anything else, take your client questions, take questions a customers ask you and turn that into a post. It's simple. A customer asked me this question the other day. This is a good question because here's three things to think about if you have this question also. Like that's valuable stuff. And I think um, have the courage to do it. Daniel. Right in that. 
Daniel, you made a post. I, I know exactly what you're referring to. I made a post recently about goals and uh, uh, that I had debated doing for a long, long time because it's not my style. But uh, it, it went over like gangbusters. Um, you know, a, I, I'm doing this workout challenge right now and, uh, you know, made a post that I would have never made on LinkedIn. And uh, I did it and it, it got the most engagement of any post I've made in recent memory, more than the podcasts, more than the, you know, the blogs about my company, more than the blogs about sales. So, um, you know, meaningfully connect. And, you know, what's uh, it, what's great about that is I've gotten a lot of really interesting outreach from like, you know, colleagues who are like, oh, my gosh, like I'm I, you know, this is my routine. This is my workout routine, this and that. And it's like just opens up so many new doors that you never thought was possible. I was on a call recently this, you know, this week and, and I was talking to somebody about some of these posts and podcasts. And I was like, hey, you know, you should come on a show with me sometime. And, you know, they, they were saying, no, I'm, I'm really introverted. And I said, you know what? I'm an introvert, too. But you know, I think the key thing about social is that it gives you the opportunity to create these relationships. And, you know, introverts want to have relationships. They just want to do it at their pace and their style. And I, social gives you the chance to do that. Yeah, I had to put Brandon's comment on here. <laughs> handing out tickets to the gun show. Love nice. it. Nice. <laughs> yes. Well, gentlemen, we are out of time. Uh, I thought today was excellent. Thank you both for always bringing the goods. And Carson, you're especially on fire today. Thank you for that. Yeah, man, he has raised um, the bar. I got to figure, like, I got to get myself worked out before next week. I'm putting some hustle behind the social selling muscle. So that's right. That's what we're doing here. Brandon, I Bring think we need, to flex post. we need to do a flex post before next week. There you oh, go. Oh, gosh. <laughs> can I can I have a can I have a month to try and get in? in you can do amazing <laughs> things with like picture manipulation these days too. Yeah, Photoshop can do a lot. And there's some good AI tools that will probably give me a six pack. So I, I'm going to work on that. Yeah, but my wife was showing me the uh, the TikTok the TikTok filter of uh, your teenager face or your young face or something. Oh boy. With this beard, it didn't change anything at all. Let's go back and watch Back to the Future when we want to see your young face. Yeah, there you You go. We could do that as well. That's how we got (laughs) to do it. I love it. All right. Uh, Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us live on LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook and everywhere else that it's going. And for everybody on the podcast, thank you so much. Be sure to take a look in the show notes. We'll have links there to uh, Modern Seller HQ if you want to join our free community. Uh, We'll also have links down there to Carson, Tom, and I. We'd love to meet you. And uh, so, everybody, thank you for joining us on Social Selling for Newbies. And Carson. Until next time, everyone. Thanks so much for being here and happy social selling. Awesome.